Welcome to the United Methodist Church at Preston Hollow and our online service here in Dallas, Texas. I hope everyone stayed safe and warm during the winter storm. We're so glad you're here joining us this Sunday. We will be online through the month of February with no in-person worship. We'll keep you posted regarding the month of March. Also, don't forget to like and share this live stream if you're watching on Facebook so that others can tune in. We invite you to stay connected with us by texting PHUMC to the number 97000. You may also visit our website at PrestonHollowChurch.com to learn more about what we're all about here at UMC Preston Hollow. Pastor Tom has a great message this morning, and we've got some great music. If you're blessed by the ministry of what we do here, I invite you to text the number 77. 77- 977 and type in the message PHUMC. We'll send you a link where you can submit your donation. It's because of your gifts that we're able to continue with missions and minister to those in our Dallas neighborhood and around the world. You can also submit your gift on our website under the Give tab. Wherever you are, whatever is going on in your life, I invite you to worship our great God today in song, prayer, and the hearing of his word. God bless you, church family, and have a great week.
your God, you have every victory. that I don't understand some things I can't come to grip with sometimes I just look out in the world and think why why me God why this situation why them Lord why this tribulation why I've been down on my luck for a while I mean I don't even have an ace in the deck. Just empty hands with no patience that's left. I'm lost in the desert, no oasis. I guess I'm hung out to dry. Lips chapped, feet hurt in this weather. I thirst and I march on, hoping to find an answer. Just an inkling of faith in this world full of cancer would be a refreshing drip of water on the tip of my tongue. The fresh, cool breeze of Jehovah's lungs is exactly what I need. I feel so far away. I mean, God, are you really with me? Do you really care? When I cry in distress, are you really there? Your word says yes, but sometimes I doubt it. But clearly my own path needs rerouting because every time I walk my own way, I get lost. And even though I'm lost in the desert, I now realize he created it. He knows where the water is. He made the sun. His creation is marvelous and he is in control even when I fail. He is faithful even when I fall. He is what I need even when I doubt. He is fresh water in the midst of the drought. He is God and he is king. He is Lord and gives life to all things. He and takes away and sometimes I just need to trust that he knows exactly what he is doing. When I am asleep, he is moving. When I fall, he is choosing to pick me back up with outstretched arms. Nothing that anyone does can separate me from his love because he is faithful. He is true. He is good. He is God. And in the desert, I Rains. Oh, it's Roy, 
Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes and let me see beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spin away. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to so highly exalted and glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. So here I that you're joining us on this particular Sunday, especially after the snowpocalypse that we're going through. Um, let us bow for just a word of prayer before we begin. Loving God, we thank you for this day and we thank you for all that you're doing in our lives and you continue to uplift us and encourage us. We ask, oh God, as we go into this time of worship that you would open us up and pour into us a full measure of your Holy Spirit so that we might hear once again your word and apply that word not only to our life, but into other people's lives as we share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We ask this in his name, and all would say, Amen. 
want to share with you this morning from the idea, what are we afraid of? What are we afraid of? And the scripture text that we'll be using comes from Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. We seem to be living through a nightmare. The endless days of more of the same. The pandemic is dragging on. Newly discovered strains continue to haunt us and hunt us. We hear daily of longtime businesses shutting their doors. My favorite Cafe Brazil on 75 in Richardson, a 24-hour establishment, has just posted. They will close at 10 on Mondays and Tuesdays. What's going on? Cannot find sufficient people to work the late shift. This is a common theme with many businesses struggling to find workers. The markets are up, they're down, the price of oil seems schizophrenic, it's all over the place, as is the projections for its future. The price of housing and goods is becoming scary. Even the shelves at the grocery store, we find some items hard to come by. What is this that's going on? I said it's like living through a nightmare because it doesn't seem like there's any end in sight. It's sort of like the movie Groundhog Day with Bill Murray. Bill plays a cynical weatherman covering, of all things, Groundhog Day in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania. He becomes trapped in a time loop, forcing him to relive February 2nd over and over and over again. I can think of some things and some times that I would love to live over and over, but Groundhog Day isn't one of them. The same is true for what we are seemingly enduring right now. We need a change. We need something different. We need to find a way to not only endure this time, but also to re-engage and reinvent the basic building blocks of who we are. In times past, the church has been the stabilizing force in our lives. The traditions, the certainty, the concepts that we learned and appropriated into our lives stood out to help stabilize us when times became difficult and disorienting. Guess what? The church is going through its own turmoil right now. We are finding fewer and fewer people who are willing to attend and support the institution. Fewer and fewer people who find worth in connecting with a faith community. Maybe we are living through a nightmare. In our text today, Jesus is about to turn the world upside down for a few folks. He's going to bring them to an inflection point in their lives where everything will change. Nothing will ever be the same again. Let's listen to Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Genesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, He fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We are told Jesus was standing by the lake of Genesaret, and for the uninitiated, that's the same as the Sea of Galilee. We are informed that Jesus has been preaching the Word of God, and the people are crowding up on Him to hear. The crowds become so large and thick that Jesus is forced to get into a boat, to get a little distance from those He's trying to teach. Jesus asks Simon to row out a little ways from the shore, and Simon does as he's asked. Mind you, he's fished all night long. Mind you, he has work to be done in cleaning and mending his nets, which are the tools of his livelihood. Mind you, he does as Jesus asks, without grumbling or complaining. As we are trying to figure out how to navigate this new world we're living in, there are many who grumble and complain about how things are. They complain about the inconvenience of wearing a mask, of social distancing, of finding things very different than we are accustomed to. What we seem to be hearing from many is the phrase, when we return to normal. What's normal like? What was normal? And why do we want to return there? 
These are questions we should be asking ourselves. Our future could hinge on the answers. Normal for many would be going back to the way things were pre-pandemic. If we could just get back there, it would represent a return to a more stable time, a more predictable time, a time where things made sense. You and I know, both know that that's hogwash. We want the familiar because it feels as if there's no risk in going there. We don't want to change. It's not only difficult, but it's also scary. What are we afraid of? Are we afraid that we might have to learn to adapt, to be flexible, to see the world differently? No doubt about it, change is hard and scary. We don't know what the change will be. We are afraid the change will mean we have to give up something, and that doesn't feel good to us. Jesus asked only a simple thing of Simon, put the boat out a little ways from the shore. Simon does as he's asked, and Jesus is able to complete his teaching to the crowds. Now that was a little ask, not too much, it's not too difficult. Okay, got through that one. Now I can go back to the way things are or were. Mark Galley says that God loves you and has a difficult plan for your life. In his book, Jesus, Mean and Wild, The Unexpected Love of, of an Untamable God, Galley says, the message isn't mentioned in tracts or best-selling books. It isn't proclaimed in praise choruses or PowerPoint sermons. We've heard plenty about the God of the wonderful plan and the God of possibility thinking. And in every age, lots of people follow the God who will do well by me if I do well by him. But the God who plans to make our lives difficult and if he really loves us, he makes our lives really difficult. Yet according to the Gospels, this seems to be the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. We don't generally think of change as good, and certainly not when it moves us out of our comfort zone. We're afraid of that kind of change. It might demand something of us that we don't want to give. After Jesus finished speaking to the crowds, he tells Simon to put out into the deep water and let down his nets. Now, I want us to take notice here. Jesus didn't ask. He told Simon what he wanted of him. Simon doesn't want to do it. He's fished all night and caught nothing. He knows the routine. Some days you make a catch, some days you don't. If the fish aren't cooperating, wait until the next day and see if your luck changes. There's a cycle, a familiarity to how this thing works. Let's just do as we've always done. Simon even tells Jesus just this very thing. Jesus insists, and so Simon does as he's told. As a people, we are not generally flexible and adaptable. We're probably more rigid than we should be, and that very rigidity plays out in different aspects of our lives. It especially plays out in the church. We've always done church a certain way. That's just the way it is. Don't go changing up things. The truth is, church as it has always been has failed to reach a new generation of folks. We have to face facts. Doing church the way we like it, the way we are familiar with, will not necessarily bring new people in. Now that's scary stuff. What are we afraid of? We're afraid we might lose some things that we like, while others may gain some things that we're unfamiliar with. I think maybe we just want things the way they were, you know, back to normal. We certainly don't want to put out into the deep water. Jesus didn't ask Simon what would feel good for him. He didn't ask him what was the way that he was used to doing what he did. After all, I think quite possibly it really wasn't so much about Simon as it was about those who Jesus wanted to reach. And guess where they were? That's right, in the deep water. So as Simon lets down his nets, what happens? We're told the catch of fish becomes so great, the nets are starting to break, and Simon has to call his friends in the other boat to come and help haul in this huge catch. The catch is so large that both boats begin to sink from the weight. And it's at this point, Simon falls down in front of Jesus, crying out, Go away from me, Jesus, for I am a sinful man. Simon knows he's witnessed a miracle. Simon is certain that he's not worthy to be in Jesus' presence. Simon is afraid. What are we afraid of? Are we afraid of not returning to normal might mean that we have to look at different ways of being the church? Are we afraid in a new way of being the church we might have to actually become involved with others? Are we afraid that as we become the church, our lives will suddenly be sucked into a new way of being? Are we afraid of venturing out into the deep water? And when we stop 
playing at church. We might actually become the church. And by playing at church, I mean simply singing the songs, praying the prayers, reciting the liturgy, and listening to a nice little sermon, and then returning to our normal lives. I've heard the church referred to as a volunteer organization, but you know, that's not how it started out at all. Jesus isn't looking for volunteers. A second thing in the fractured version of the fish story that doesn't float with our knowledge of the biblical Jesus is when he asked for a volunteer to do some fishing for him. In all of the actual New Testament accounts of Jesus selecting people to be his disciples, it's not a matter of volunteerism. Jesus doesn't say, mm, <clears throat> who'd be interested in following me? You maybe? He uses the imperative, and it's directed at people who aren't expecting it. And often they seem to be extremely unlikely candidates, tax collectors, fishermen, skeptics, political zealots, and the like. Not the first people to come to mind when talking about our best genetic material. What's more, on a side note, the people Jesus calls are usually in the midst of doing something else, totally unrelated, like making a living as professional fishermen. They generally aren't the ones wildly waving their hands saying, pick me, Jesus, pick me. In fact, in the examples the Gospels record of people volunteering to be disciples, Jesus doesn't exactly turn them away, but he describes for them what they can expect as a disciple so starkly that it is doubtful that they joined his band at all. Jesus wasn't wild about volunteers. He said in John 15 and 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you. Our normal, my friends, seems as if it has been playing at church. We have the opportunity to do away with the normal. We have the opportunity to become the church in a very real sense. Becoming the church may involve us doing things differently and at different times. It might mean our worship is feeding the hungry, taking our worship out of this pretty place and putting feet to it, going to where people are hurting, discovering how we can be the church as we seek to bring miracles to bear in people's lives. You'll remember a couple of years ago, pre-pandemic, when we were a part of the birthday party project, providing a birthday party for a homeless child, giving them a positive experience to remember their birthday. Now, we didn't seek to gain the child, the child's parents, or the friends as members. That wasn't our goal. Our goal was to bring happiness and joy to bear in a place where it's seldom seen. Being the church might look a lot like that. Is that what we're afraid of? Being the church might involve us connecting to those who find themselves ostracized by the wider community. We might connect with those who have no place that feels like home because they've been kicked out and kicked around by those who should have loved them. I'm thinking specifically of the marginalized teens who, because of their gender fluidity or gender bending identity or their orientation, have been put out of their homes, out of their places of belonging, even out of their churches. That might really be being the church. Is that what we're afraid of? Jesus presented a new way of thinking about and approaching a relationship with God. This new way presented God as a loving parent. This new way presented people with the fact that God was dwelling in them. This new way was saying God wants us to treat one another differently, not in the same old normal way. Jesus told Simon, do not be afraid. And from that moment on, Simon and his fisherman friends left everything to follow Jesus. That's quite a change, wouldn't you say? Change had come. There was no asking. Jesus simply said, follow me, and they went. What are we afraid of? Are we afraid if we let Jesus in our life, our life will be dramatically different? Are we afraid if we start reaching out to those others have left behind that we might actually become the church that Jesus speaks about? Joseph M. Stowell, in Following Christ, says, Gandhi was once asked by a close friend, if you admire Christ so much, why don't you become a Christian? Gandhi reportedly replied, when I meet a Christian who is a follower of Christ, I may consider it. Mao Zedong came to America as a university student, intrigued by Christianity and Western culture. But after encountering several Christians and our brand of Christianity, he became disillusioned and turned his heart toward Marxism. And we know the rest of that story. It seems to me that this is not what Christ had in mind when he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Something significant has happened since Christ issued that call nearly 2,000 years ago. We have become quite happy to call ourselves Christian with little or no thought of following. As a result, we are paying dearly through a loss of fulfillment, personal satisfaction, and our impact on our world. 
My friends, can we hear Jesus calling to us today? Can we hear Jesus saying, come, follow me? Jesus is telling us it's our time, it's our turn to change the world by being his followers. We have to let go of the pettiness of needing things to be our way. And let's let it be the way of Jesus. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.